Awesome. Move it this like that then. Okay. Hello everyone. This is um <laughs> Cadet, sorry. <clears throat> Alright, Cadet. So Cadet is a giant doodle. Hold on me. Hands free tour of this guy. So Cadet here is a giant doodle. See this? He's like literally spilling out over my table. <laughs> and when you look at him, for the, you know, for the lay person, right, for the untrained eye, he looks fine, right? He doesn't look matted. He looks fine, right? Just a little curly like a doodle should be, right? But when I feel it, I feel roughness. I feel the clumpiness down under the skin. I can feel the tangles and the matted hair. Now, this is not to say anything bad about the owners taking care of it. He's actually in great shape, you know. It's just that during the spring, what happens is, I'm going to see if I can explain this well, because I've been, I've been working on, you know, trying to use analogies and explain what's going on. So, hey, good morning, Letty. How are you? Good morning, Melissa. Melissa the Grimmer. What's up? All right. Let me see if I can explain this well. During the spring or the fall, during these transition periods, right, what we do is we change our outfits, right? We put away our winter clothes and we bring out our springtime clothes, right? The warmer outfits or we go buy new clothes, right? Um, with the dogs though, because they don't have the luxury of going and buying new, a new springtime outfit, you know, a new wardrobe, they grow their clothes from their skin, right? So what he's doing is he's getting rid of his winter wardrobe, his winter outfit, right? to make room in his skin to grow the springtime outfit, right? So that's how they stay fresh every season. We change our clothes. We put away our winter clothes or we put away our, you know, when it starts to get cooler in the fall, we put away our summer clothes. We start to bring out the sweaters and things like that, right? Just like how we change our outfits with the season changes, they change their outfit, only they don't put on clothes. They grow their clothes from their skin. They grow their outfit, right? So that's what's going on during the springtime. And so that's why, you know, whenever dogs get, start to get matted, it can get pretty carried, you know, it gets carried away pretty quickly, right? See that? So even though he doesn't really look matted, when we go down there with the metal comb, and it has to be metal because the plastic combs don't really have the strength to get down to the skin level and pull out the, the tangled bundles of dead hair. See? And so... Once I go over it like that, right? Now, and it's not much. Look at this. It's just a very fine layer of this old winter underwear. Now it's old and brittle and rough. You know, just throw the underwear away, right? That way they can grow new underwear, their undercoat, because now we've made room in those pores. Now this section of hair actually feels nice and smooth. This feels rough. But once I go through and comb it, good boy. Now it feels much better. And just imagine how much better it would feel for him as well. It's like taking layers of clothes off, right? It's that we're removing it from his skin, literally pulling it out of his, his pores, those packed full pores that feel bumpy. But once we clear it out, his skin feels smooth, his, his hair feels nice and silky, you know? Okay, go, oh, good morning, Lee. What's up, Wendy? Um, Melissa says, we don't do that in OB in Phoenix. Uh huh, okay. And, and Melissa, um, I'm not, this is not um, saying that professional groomers should do this. Um, uh, obviously, not. And, and this, I actually want to show this process of what I do before the bath in order to avoid shaving him down. And I, I can do a nice, fluffy, long haircut like they like, a nice hair teddy bear. Because the only other option, really, if I don't comb out all of this, that's, you know, tangles and everything, then the only other option is to shave him, you know, just to shave, remove the coat, just shave it all off, or to go really short, you know, but I want to show the process and the amount of time it takes in order to do it, because um, I want to, there's a lot, I know that there's a lot of friction, there's a lot of tension between dog groomers and dog owners. Um, what I'm doing is tail now. 
And a lot of it, I think, is a misunderstanding, a confusion, you know, because what happens is, I even talked about this on my Facebook page recently because a groomer actually reached out to me because she was um, shaving an extremely matted coat, much, much worse than this, um, just, just pelted. And the dog even had like an infection kind of on the side, a rough area on the skin because he was pulling at it. But anyways, um, the, I think the confusion is that um, owners don't really, the pet owners don't really understand that if, if a groomer was going to save the coat, they have to do the amount of brushing that wasn't done for the past two, three weeks, you know? And that, that's like hours worth of brushing. You know, it takes me a good, for a dog this size, a good two, two hours maybe to go through and brush him from head to toe. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, if a groomer is gonna spend that kind of time, um, because he takes me about a good four or five hours from start to finish. So I just started on him, and I start by brushing. And the really thick area is like the tail. The reason why I go through with the slicker brush first is because it breaks up that coat. There we go. So if you have a doodle and you're a doodle owner and you're tired of the groomer just shaving your dog, you know, then this is what you have to do before you take your dog to the groom dog groomer to get a haircut is this, you know, getting the comb and working it through this coat, getting all of these mats and tangles out. Because once I can get this comb to go through his coat, that's the goal right now for the prep session. My goal is to get this comb to go through the coat without catching on dead hair or tangles. And once I can get this coat to slide through the coat smoothly, then I know that I've gotten enough hair out. I've, I've created enough room inside those pores to give them a bath. Because now I know that the there's room for the deep conditioning, a proper conditioning, you know, cleaning. And also with this nice smooth hair that's nice and separated, it lathers much easier too. So I'm saving time lathering. It lather and I'm saving shampoo as well because it just lathers up much, much nicely, much more easily. Alrighty. Because with all this dead coat still in there that I'm catching through, let's just say I didn't separate these hairs and it's all still clumped up. It would probably take maybe a good two, three handfuls to get this to get a good coverage on this tail. But when I comb through it like this, then maybe one one good handful I'll get the whole tail lathered up nicely. So you're saving shampoo, getting much more better results because this is the hair that's smelling. So by removing that hair, we're, we're, when we wash him, he's gonna actually smell nice for weeks to come. The reason why dogs smell a few days after the bath, when you're, when you're washing, when you're just going straight to the tub without combing them out, is because by washing this hair, you're washing like dirty underwear, like wet rags, you know? And, and like just old kitchen rags, you know? And after a while, it doesn't matter how much you wash it, it still smells every time you get it wet because it's just so old and, you know, you just gotta throw it away and get new underwear, right? Okay, so, and the reason why I like to work from back to front is because when I'm, when I'm combing, right, if I'm combing here, I, you know, for example, and I keep working down, I'm running into more and more mats, right, all the way down. But when I start from the tail and I work up, because all the mats are cleared here, as I work up, there's no mats catching, see? So, and it's much easier too, they call it line brushing. Any questions? I'm just kidding, I was talking about the winter clothes things. Oh, okay, oh yeah, that's right, <laughs> Melissa. Nice. Okay. All right, so, good boy, Cadet. Since he's giving me this side, I'll go ahead and comb this side out. Okay. So, let me show you. Oh, you can see here too. Because it's really clumpy, right? If I just go through with this, it's going to pull way too much. It's going to hurt a lot. So I'm going on this side here. So maybe I'll move the camera so you can see.
So what I'm gonna do, there we go, is I'm gonna break up the coat with the slicker brush first. Just break it up. Oh man, there's like a bunch of mats right here at the foot, you know, because this is where you're gonna find a lot of matting because this is, you know, that's their paws when they're running around the wet grass and everything. And it's a high friction area, you know, they're rubbing on things. So it's gonna mat up much more easily down here. So we wanna just break it up. See, even though I'm not really getting much hair on the slicker brush, the outer coat is still separated, right? So that I can get in there with the comb and comb it out. And now it's not perfect. There's still probably some more dead hair in there. See that? If I comb the other way. But as long as I can get the comb to go through, I know that I can give him a good bath. And when I dry him out, I'm not gonna be running into a bunch of matted hair while I'm trying to dry him. It'll be nice and separated. He'll dry nice and fluffy. There we go. Oh, look at that. It's got some kind of... Look at that. Alrighty. I found a stick in there earlier when I was combing him. Or just kind of checking him out. I ran my fingers through his body just to kind of assess his coat. And I found a stick. I was like, what are you doing with a concealed weapon, buddy? <laughs> just walking around with the stick, you know, hidden inside his coat. Because you never know, you know what I'm saying? Life is like that, you just never know. I don't blame him, no judgment, you know? Protecting himself. <laughs> Anyways, okay. See that? So that's the matted dead hair I'm going after. But that's just, uh, you know, one area here. So I gotta do the whole leg. And here's how I like to do it in my mind. Because if I look at the whole entire dog, right? I look at this giant thing and I can feel overwhelmed. I can feel like, oh my God, <laughs> look at all of this, right? Um, so what I like to do is just break it up into session, sections. Let me turn my phone on vibrate, vibrate. not violent, <laughs> silent. I was, I was trying to say vibrate and silent at the same time. Turn my phone on violent. <laughs> all right. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what a violent mode would be, um, what that would do. <laughs> My phone it will start to verbally accost me, you know. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, what I like to do is break it up into sections. So tail, right? So I got the tail combed out. Perfect, good. Then I like to do one one real leg, and I, and I almost like a section, you know, this section. And then once I once I get this section brushed and combed out, then I move on to the next section, right? This front leg, right? And I know. I'm skipping this torso for a reason, but I do this leg section, this front leg section. Then I usually do the head because I'm here anyways, and I brush out the both, you know, the head both ears, and then I brush out this section here, and then this last leg section here. Then all I have it left is the torso here because this is pretty easy to brush out. This is the easiest section, the body. So I save it for last, you know, because by then I'm pretty worn out. And it's like a nice little treat, you know, before the before the bath. Then we get naked, and we. I was <laughs> but anyways, because this see just with a few sweats already, it feels nice. So the because the body's so easy, and the legs are hard, the tail's thick and hard, you know. <laughs> um, <sighs> the the hair is impacted, making the tail thick, you know, and it's difficult. Um, to brush out sometimes. That's what I meant. <laughs> I didn't mean to say thick and hard, you know. Anyways, um, and then this section here is the difficult sections first. Get it done. And again, the goal is to get this comb to go through the coat. So I don't want you to focus so much on what exact tool I'm using, right? It's just, I'm, I'm just picking the best tool for the job. You know, what tool is going to get me there? Shoot, sorry about that, guys. I got cut off. So I don't know where I got cut off, so let me just repeat what I was saying. The goal is to get this comb 
through the code, right? So I don't want you to get caught up on which exact tool I'm using or you know how I'm using it. My goal is to get that cone through the code. So I'm going to pick and use whatever tool I think, and, and experience has a lot to do with it as well. You know, just over the years using different tools and just feeling it and seeing how it works. You know, just knowing which tool is gonna get you there the fastest. But let's just see, I can have a slicker brush to work with. Then I can use this mat, mat, um, matting rake, dematting rake. And I can go through and do pretty much the same thing, right? Takes a little bit more finesse, I guess, a little more skill. But I can go through with this. So the tool, I feel like, doesn't matter as much as the groomer that with intention, you know, what is the intention? What is the goal that you're trying to achieve, right? And how are you approaching it? And I think, you know, as long as we know what the end goal is, keeping that end goal in mind, and you're just working towards that end goal. And my end goal is to get that comb through this code. But it's not gonna be able to get through the code with all of this matted hair that I'm cutting through right now. You know, especially in these folded areas, these high friction areas. So once I get through all of this, good boy. And see, I'm pulling out. I'm not pulling, like tugging at it. I'm going in and then just releasing. See that? There we go. You hear that? It's like breaking up those mats. There we go. So we can go through with this. And this is just an example. But even if I didn't have this, this just kind of saves time because it's breaking up the matted hair in bulk. But you know, you can go through with the slicker brush and just break it up like this. And then go through with the comb and comb it out. Okay, see? So I'll show you here. See when I pull the coat away, you can see the tangled mat at the skin level. See that? When you pull the coat apart and look at the skin, look at all of that tangled hair at the skin level, those mats. See, and that's what's making the dog feel uncomfortable. Sometimes they're panting a lot, they're hot, because it's like wearing layers of clothes, you know, layers of clothing. So by removing these layers of old hair, old clothing, we're helping them not only feel better, look better, smell better. There we go. So now that we kind of got it all broken up, I can go through with the comb and just comb it out. And so I know, you know, people tell me all the time, Jun, you're crazy to sit there and just comb that out you know, for hours like that. They're like, how much do you charge? And I just tell them I charge enough. You know, I charge enough. <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, $400? They're like, no, of course not. Because I don't need to make $400 in a day, you know? <laughs> uh, I charge enough to meet my needs. But, you know, for me, it's not even about the money. It's just, I enjoy it. I enjoy what um, And the chef said, the more you care, the more you prepare talking about the food and how you prepare the ingredients and you know how you cook the ingredients properly give it enough time to cook at the right temperature don't rush it you know things like that you honor the ingredient you know you honor the food that you're cooking and i just i really like that it's like i spend time preparing the code for the bath so i can have an excellent bath you know i want excellent results and the only way I'm gonna get excellent results from the bath is if I do an excellent job combing out and preparing the coat. You know, and why would I spend the time and effort, you know, sweating like this? You know, spending this time, why would I do that? It's because I care so much about the work that I do. I know that this is not just about the way the dog looks. Of course I want the dog to look good, you know, because I don't want people to look at my haircuts, right? Look at the dogs I have haircuts on and say, if my haircuts look like that, I'd focus on the skin too. You know, I don't want, I don't want my skincare talk 
to seem like an excuse, a way to justify not doing a good haircut, you know, oh, the haircuts don't matter anyways, you know, it's all, the skin's more important, you know, I don't want it to seem like that. So I do want to do a really nice haircut, make sure the dog looks nice, um, but I really don't want to take away from the skincare either because, you know, a healthy skin really is a healthy coat because a healthy skin grows the healthy hair. So in my opinion, what I believe is that by spending this time going through and combing out, clearing out the, the hair, the pores of all that dead hair, that's literally, you see dander coming out of the skin, like little, like dandruff, like snowflakes or something, just pouring out, just popping out of the skin while you're combing out this dead hair. And um, when I stand him up, after I comb this back leg out, I'll have him stand. So I can show you the difference between the leg that's combed out and the leg that's not combed out. We'll, I'll show it to you side by side. And it will be obvious. It will be clear as day, night and day, which leg is going to look and feel better after the bath. You know, if we washed him without combing this out, uh, he's he's not really going to look that great or smell that great after the bath. It's still going to feel rough. He's still going to smell. But by combing this out, spending the time, and I'm not saying that professional groomers at a groomer, if, or unless you're going to schedule that one dog for the whole day, but then you have the shop overhead to cover, you know, so what are you going to do? Charge $600, $700 to groom one dog, you know? Hey, if there's an owner that's willing to pay that, take their dog to a grooming shop and have them essentially shut down the shop <laughs> for the day for their one dog so they can clean their dog out and work on their one dog for seven hours. Um, and they're willing to pay that shop owner 700 bucks or 800 bucks just to break even for, their, for that day because they have all the overhead expenses and their employees. Um, it just, for me, it doesn't make sense that uh, a doodle owner would bring their doodle into a grooming shop and ask the shop owner or the groomers at the grooming shop to save their dog's tangled up coat. And, and again, like I'm showing, even though it doesn't look tangled from the outside, when you get a comb and you start to investigate a little deeper, you know, at the skin level, well, then you start getting in, running into all the tangles and the mats and everything all hidden there under the top coat. So this is not, you know, to show like, oh, you know, groomers should be, if you're, if you want your dog um, that has a doodle type of coat, this type of coat, if you don't want them shaved, you know, if you don't like the shaved look, and you want your dog to stay long and fluffy, uh, this is what you're gonna have to do before you take your dog to the dog groomer to get their hair cut. Just like if, my, if I didn't comb my daughter's hair for six weeks, right, and she didn't comb her hair, I didn't comb her hair, nobody brushes my daughter's hair, right? And for six weeks, and now she has, <laughs> Her hair is tangled, matted, and I take her to the hairdresser and I ask them to give her a nice haircut, you know? I don't know. I mean, I don't have any personal experience with this, so I wouldn't know, but I would imagine the hairstylist, you know, may call child services on me, right? Or, um, and, and one time we did take, we, you know, we took our daughters to get a haircut and the hairstylist spent like the first 15, 20 minutes just combing through my daughter's hair, you know, getting all the tangles out and everything. First 15, 20 minutes, because my daughter Ava has like a really thick head of hair. But anyways, you know, it kind of reminded me <laughs> of how I would like comb out a dog before just starting a haircut. But yeah, I mean, this is what you got to do. Someone has to take the time and actually comb it out, you know, prepare the coat for the bath, you know, you prepare, and the bath is preparing the coat for a nice haircut, you know? So it's true, the more you care, the more you prepare. There you go. Good boy, cadet. There you go. You're 
You're such a good boy. And he's so awesome. Oh my goodness. I've been grooming him for like two years now, maybe three years now. Coming here, and now he just knows the routine. <laughs> he comes, he steps up on the table. <laughs> Oh, he's like, and then he lays down. He's like, "Come on, let's get up, let's get on with this." But I think it's because he feels so comfortable after he's done. You know, all the matted hair is out. He has a nice haircut. He's feeling good. So, even though I, you know this part is a chore for me as well. You know, look at me. I'm sweating. You know, oh, sweating. You know, so this part is a chore for both of us. I understand, you know, it's like, but it's so worth it because the, at the end, when he's looking so natural and beautiful, right, it's, it's stunning. And, and the way that they look at, after you're all done, it's so rewarding to know that I, I did that, you know, I put in the time and effort and I sweat and I did that, I, you know, it's the work of my own hands. And I love, I say that all the time, you know, I create moments of happiness and joy with the work of my own hands. This fills me with a sense of purpose and pride. And it just, to know that the work that I did creates such happiness, you know, because when dog goes out there and stress their stuff after they're done with the haircut, and I hear them like, oh my God, you look so nice. And, you know, they're rubbing their hands through their dog and, their dog's all happy. It's like, wow. You know, I, I created that with, with my own hands, you know? Like, wow. It makes me feel like I'm alive, like I'm living my purpose, you know, like that I have a purpose, you know? Okay. So that's why, for me, you know, and I know people are like, June, life is not a fairy tale, you know? Like, a lot of people try to talk sense into me. And they tell me all the time, dude, you are not a businessman, you know? <laughs> but for me, I know a lot of people tell me I have my head in the clouds. I'm very idealistic, you know? I believe in the goodness of people. I believe in the kindness of others. I've seen it. I witnessed it. But, you know, okay, people call me naive. But I still want to believe in magic. You know, I still, I never want to lose that wonder because, <clears throat> okay, check this out, right? I hope you got your boots on. It's about to get deep. Check this out. Think about the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, right? What if, what if Jack was a reasonable guy. What if Jack was a responsible, mature human being, right? And he did what his mom told him to do. He sold the cow at the market and bought food with it. They would have been good for maybe a month or two, but that was their last cow. She stopped giving milk. They were out of resources. You know, after that money, that, the little bit of money they would have got for that old cow, whatever grocery, whatever food they got with that, once that was done, so were they, game over, right? But Jack was naive enough. Jack was foolish enough to believe in magic, right? And he traded the cow for the three beans. He, he, he never gave up hope. Jack invested in hope, right? And of course, it was a stupid move. How stupid is that? You, you traded your last resource for three magic beans? Are you an idiot? Of course his mom was mad at him throws the beans out the window, you know? What an idiot. He goes to bed, sad, probably feeling like a failure, probably feeling like I, all I wanted to do was help. I thought, I, I thought this was an opportunity, you know? I took a chance. And then boom, you know? Then they got, you know, everything changed for them, right? But what if, what if Jack was an obedient, responsible, reasonable person? He didn't do things the way he, believed in his heart, right? If he didn't follow his heart, what would the story be called, right? The story would be called Jack and No Beanstalk. It'd be called Jack and Nothing. No one would even know about them. <laughs> they would have died in obscurity, starvation, and they would have just been, you know, another unfortunate story in the history books. But Jack, 
because he was foolish, because he was unwilling to give up belief, right, in his dreams, in his hopes, in his, you know, now we have Jack and the Beanstalk story, right? <laughs> but anyways, so that's just a long-winded <laughs> philosophical way to answer the question, you know, Gene, why do you do this, you know? It's because this is what makes me feel, oh my goodness, like I'm doing something real, you know? Look at this. Now that I've got, once I comb through his, his one leg like this, you can't put that hair back in there. <laughs> You know, oh, look at that dander coming out. You can't put that hair back in there once it's combed out. And once it's combed out, you know, it feels so wonderful, right? It looks nice and soft now. Look at that. And the crazy thing is, when I first started grooming him, he had such bad skin. And all here was like brown. There was, there was like, you could see the skin. There was not a lot of hair. But over the years, you know, every time I groom him, because I clear out the skin, I give the skin a good environment to work in, to heal itself. Now, he doesn't have those hot spots anymore, those rough areas. Are there any questions? Oh, what's up? Good morning, Sue. Hey, what's up, Leah? That says, how often does this pup get groomed? About every six weeks, about every five, six weeks. Sweetheart Kitchens, meow. It would have been Jack says goodbye to his cow. <laughs> exactly. You know? And that's the thing. It's like, I personally believe that life, life is, is about the adventure, right? Helen Keller says life is a great adventure or nothing at all, right? Life is about the adventure. It's about the story we get to tell. So that's why I say, like, do it for the story. You know, do things for what it'll make of you, the story you get to tell. Is he always as calm? Yeah. Oh, you, you need a bigger table. table. Yeah, right? He's like spilling over the table. He's huge. <clears throat> but yeah, he's always as calm. And also, I bought this from show season yesterday. Or no, on Thursday, show season had a tent sale. Oh, has a price tag there. It's $9. <laughs> All right, but anyways, it's called Mellow Pet. Mellow Pet. Right, I got this at show season, and oh, he's got to be at least 120 pounds, maybe. He's huge. But anyways, um, this has it like calming oils, calming relief for grooming visits, competition, travel, fireworks, or bath time. And I just sprayed it on myself, kind of like cologne, and you know, just it, it seems to really help. But he's always pretty calm. Okay, so now I got the tail on this back leg. I'm gonna ask him to stand. Okay. Yeah, can you stand, buddy? Thank you, buddy. Up, up. Thank you. Up, up. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Thank you, cadet. Okay. All right. Up, up. Up, up. Up, up. Thank you, cadet. All right. Okay, so let me, let me grab the camera here. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is the leg that we combed out, right? That I combed out. Not we. She giving you guys credit for nothing. You guys did nothing but sit there and watch. Shoot, I did all this. What? Why are you trying to take her? <laughs> I'm kidding. So this is the comb that I combed out, right? I mean, this is the leg that I combed out, right? Look at that. So I'm still getting some dead hair, which not much, right? The comb can still go through. And the, when I feel it soft, look at that, right? Now this, we did not comb. You see the difference? It feels, oh man. It feels clumpy, feels thick, rough, and no chance, not a chance, you know? I gotta break it up with the slicker brush and do all that first. Break up this top coat and then I can get the comb through. But see, this is the goal. When I'm prepping a dog for the bath, when I'm prepping the skin, that's what I mean. I'm try my goal is to get this comb to go through the coat because when I can do that, then I know that the skin is ready for the bath because the hair is an extension of the skin. We really should consider calling it skin coat, not skin and coat, as if they're two separate entities. The coat, the hair is an extension of the skin. So we really could look at it as skin coat. So when we feel areas like this, where it's like, you know, tangled up, we know that that's a bundle of dead hair 
that's tangled up and stuck in those pores. And by, if I had two hands, I would be able to get that much better. I'm holding the camera with one, but I'm just trying to see if I can, there we go. See, so you don't really have to pull hard and you don't have, it's not force. You just have to kind of tease it. See that? Because it, the hair is all dead anyways, and it's a bundle of it, which makes it, you know, so strong. But if you, by just by tapping it a little bit and loosening up some of those bundles, see that? Boom. Look at that. So it's not by force. You're not getting rid of these um, mats and tangles by yanking at it. It's not about how strong you are. It's about how patient you are and understanding how that matting works. See that? Now I can even go through with the fine tooth side. And you see how I flip the comb like that? That is a must. If you are a samurai, you know what I'm saying? If you are a professional groomer, you need to flip it like that. Anyways, all righty. Not to show off too many of my skills, you know. I was, he is huge. My face is the size of his anus. Look at this. Um, do you not like the longer, heavier combs for these Labrador or bigger dogs? Yeah, I do. I do like the bigger combs. Um, let's see. L Lullaby, Lulu. We have a Labradoodle with a fleece coat. We have decided to shave him down every couple of months and just start over each time. He never took to brushing, no matter how gentle. Exactly. So I'm glad you brought that up because there are some dogs that just cannot tolerate the brushing. They scream, they howl, they... You know, they're, they act very painfully. It's like, it's like you're torturing them. And for those dogs, unfortunately, you have to just shave them down because you don't want to do, put them through hours of that. But this guy here, he really appreciates it. Look at this. And see, that's what holds all the smell. So he's already smelling better. Even in this area here, where you usually would smell really bad, it smells pretty good because I combed out this. This side is gonna smell though. See that? So it's kind of like getting them, it's like a pre-cleaning before the bath. So when I wash him, I don't have to worry that he's going to smell afterwards or the next day or a few days later. He's not going to smell a few days later because this is no longer in there to make him smell. I hope, I hope I'm explaining this well. I hope, hope you guys are understanding this. Okay, so now, oh my goodness. Good boy, look at this. He's about as tall as I am. Look at this. Isn't this crazy? Oh my goodness, could I like head down? So yeah, he's such a good boy. <clears throat> Anyways, okay. Remember when I started grooming him a few years ago? I used to sing while I was in here, you know. But then I went through kind of a rough spot emotionally. I stopped singing. <laughs> Anyways. And also I realized, what am I doing singing, you know? I'm not June the singer, you know what I'm saying? I'm not June the vocal extraordinaire. I'm June the groomer, you know? So, let me, while I'm doing this part here. So you can see my amazing, <laughs> anyways. Okay, so again, same idea. Oh, you know what, let me just do this front part here. Okay. There we go. So same idea. We're just gonna go through. See that start at the bottom. Brush our way up. Alrighty. And you can spray some, you know, detangling spray. Right now I'm using this. But I do have some other sprays I got from uh, show season. Just wanting to use up what I have already now. But anyways, you can spray a little bit of leave-in conditioner. There we go. Helps the hair slip a little better. Yeah, so if you were to compare my grooming style, if you were to compare it to like a cooking style, right? I would say that my style of grooming is, um, I prefer the natural look, you know? So you know how some chefs, they, 
they like get a carrot, but not just any carrot. They go out and they pick the carrot themselves and then they, they cook it perfectly, you know? They don't overcook it, they don't undercook it, they cook it perfectly and season it very lightly with some sea salt and, you know, do very little to it, but they let the ingredient do the work. They just cook it perfectly, you know, or they try to cook it perfectly every time. I think that's my grooming style. I, I like the natural look. I want to honor and enhance and highlight the natural look of the dog. Um, so, you know, that's my grooming style is very simple. Simple, not easy, but it's very simple what I'm doing. I'm just combing out the dog till I can get him combed out, right? Wash him, and then I do a, a nice little trim, you know, and scissor up and just shape him, you know? Just highlight the natural look of the dog. And I tell people all the time, if you only knew how hard it is, how much, how much work it takes to get a dog to look natural, you know? It takes a lot of work to get a dog to look natural, to keep a dog looking natural. <laughs> but that's my grooming style. And it's not, it's not the right style. It's not the style that I say that everybody should do. It's my style, you know? And I'm not, I'm not advocating that this is the way everybody should groom. This is the way I groom because for me, it's an art. This is my art, you know? And when I'm finished with the dog and I, I look at the haircut, I love that feeling of pride. I know that might be a bad word to feel prideful, but that's how I feel. I feel proud of myself. And I like to feel proud of myself. And here's the thing. I feel like we, there's a distinction that needs to be made between pride and arrogance. I think that it's good to be proud because you know, having pride for your nation, isn't that a good thing to be proud of the country you're from, to be proud of your family that you're from, you know, to have pride in your family name, things like that, your culture. Have, having pride in, in oneself and something that you do, I think is a good thing. I think it's healthy for your self-esteem. Arrogance is where I think we run into trouble. And I think arrogance is a puffed up version of pride. It's a false pride. It's, being, it's wanting to be proud of yourself without actually having a stable foundation, a good reason to feel proud of yourself. It's wanting to feel proud of yourself even though you didn't clean your room when you meant to, when you knew you should have, but you, you didn't, you let it go. And instead of doing something that you knew was productive, maybe you sat down and just, you know, played some, <laughs> Play some mobile games, you know, on your phone or whatever, you know, and things like that. But you still want to feel proud of yourself. So then you go and, you know, make it seem like you did much more, things like that. I think that when you, when you don't do what's difficult and necessary, you know, and, you, and when you want to just do what's fun and easy, but then you try to justify that, I think that's where the arrogance comes in, right? And, and I think arrogance is expecting people to like you and expecting people to treat you, you know, in a special way. I think that's arrogance. Um, pride, pride comes from doing the difficult things, doing something that was difficult, but necessary, you know? They say that we feel the best about ourselves when we do something difficult, when we do something that was challenging, that wasn't easy. That's when we feel the best about ourselves. So, Oh man, I think that having pride in something that you've accomplished, um, working hard towards a goal and achieving it and feeling proud about that, I think that's absolutely necessary. You know, like I tell my daughters all the time, I don't expect you to win everything, but I do want you to want to win that desire to win, you know? And sometimes my old, younger daughter, she gets angry. She has a, a little bit of a temper. I don't know where she gets it from, <laughs> but um, she hates to lose. She's very competitive and she gets upset and angry. Sometimes she cries and she's getting better though. And I told her, you know, I'm actually, I'm actually happy you're this way. You know, I was like, you know, we can work on it, of course, and you can learn to control it. But I was like, 
you have a desire to do well, you have a desire to want to do things excellently, and you don't like to lose. I was like, that's a good thing, you know? I would much rather have that and teach you to control it than have somebody complacent, you know, that just doesn't care if they win or lose. I don't care, you know, whatever. You know, to have somebody complacent like that, just, you know, and, you know, try to teach them <laughs> to have that desire to want to do well, to do an excellent job, you know, like, that would be difficult. But to, but to you know, have my daughter already have that desire to want to do well, you know, and not like to lose, you know, and now all I have to do is just kind of, you know, help encourage her to control that, you know, control her emotions a little bit better. Oh, man. All right, so, you know, I have a pretty good example about arrogance and pride, the difference. Look at this, isn't that crazy? <clears throat> oh, I got a question. Claudia, do you clean the room you work in afterwards? Just wondering, no, of course not. Shoot, <laughs> why would I clean my, my own mess, you know? When you get to my level, <laughs> when you get to my level of fame, you know, and notoriety, you know, my level of recognition and acclaim, you know, you just, I don't have to clean after myself. They have other people come in and clean after me. Peasants, you know, peasants, servants. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course I clean up after myself. <laughs> I try to clean up best I can. I try to leave this room cleaner than I came in, than, you know, when I found it, because um, I don't want people to roll their eyes whenever they know that I'm coming to groom their dogs. I don't want people to be like, Jane's coming today again, you know, he's gonna make a mess in the room, you know? Or I don't, you know, so I do my best to try to clean up as best I can. And that way, you know, I want it to be a pleasure to do business with me. You know, I wanna try to make it convenient as possible. You know, I want, for me, I know this is delusional, but when I drive away after grooming my client's dogs, when I drive, when I you know make the drive home, I pull out of their driveway and I drive home, I like to imagine that they're high-fiving each other. <laughs> you know, like, yes, we won. You know, I wanna give my clients that feeling that they won, that they got the better end of the deal. I never wanna feel like overcharged you know, or I didn't give more in value than I accepted in payment. I always wanna give more in use value, then I accept in payment. And that's in order to make an investment in my own future, because that's what Jim Rohn said. Jim Rohn says, always do more than is expected of you. Always do more than what you're paid for in order to make an investment in your own future. And so far, everything that he said is true from in me, you know, in my life. Um, one thing he said that I really took to heart was, if you just forget about the money, Right? If you just forget about the money, how much you're getting paid, and you just do the best you possibly can, and you serve your clients to the best of your ability, then they will take you by the hand and they will open doors for you that you never could have opened yourself, that you never even knew existed. And in my life, that has been absolutely true. Once I stopped worrying about the money, once I stopped calculating how much per hour this job calculates out to be, and I stopped thinking, well, if this is all I'm getting paid, this is all I'm gonna do. No one's gonna take advantage of me, right? Mama didn't raise no fool. Once I let go of that attitude, and I told myself, no matter what my pay is, I will always do my very best. I always wanna feel proud of the work that I did. It doesn't matter how much I'm getting paid. Once I adopted that uh, philosophy, doors have opened for me that I never could have imagined and I never could have opened on my own, you know? So, but okay, back to the example of pride versus arrogance. <clears throat> There's a guy named Simon Sinek, right? He tells a story of the Under Secretary of Defense. You may have heard me tell this story before because I repeat things, you know? Um, but anyways, <laughs> just in case some of you haven't heard it, um, so the Under Secretary of Defense was at a convention, um, you know, speaking at a convention. Well, he was the former Under Secretary of Defense. So the former Under Secretary of Defense is at a convention speaking. <clears throat> In mid-speech, he 
breaks from his notes, his prepared notes. He takes a sip of his coffee and he looks at his styrofoam cup, which has his coffee in it. And he says, you know, last year when I was the Undersecretary of Defense, I was flown here business class. At the airport, there was a chauffeur who took me to the hotel and they already had me checked in and the gentleman helped me, the bell, you know, the bellman helped me with my bags up to my room. In the morning, there was another car waiting for me that brought me to this arena. He said, when I got here, they ushered me to the green room where I was offered a cup of coffee in a beautiful ceramic cup. He said, this year, I am no longer the Undersecretary of Defense. I flew here, you know, coach, <laughs> and I, you know, caught a taxi, a cab to the hotel, checked my bags in, and lugged my, you know, baggage to my room, my luggage to the room. In the morning, I caught another cab to this arena, and when I finally found my way to the green room, I asked one of the aides if I could have a cup of coffee. And he pointed me to a self-serve station where I poured myself a coffee, a cup of coffee, and this here ceramic cup. The point is, I never deserved the ceramic cup. The ceramic cup was never meant for me. It was meant for the position that I held. I always deserved the styrofoam cup. And I think that's the lesson we all must learn. Every single one of us, you know, myself included, as hard as that, as hard as that is to believe, me too. <laughs> we all deserve the styrofoam cup. None of us actually deserve the ceramic cup. That's meant for the position that we hold. That's humility. Understanding that I actually deserve the styrofoam cup. And anytime I get favors, Anytime people show me generosity, or as I get more senior in my industry, in my career, I start to get more favors, and I start to get more, um, you know, better treatment. I have to remind myself, this is not meant for me. This is just meant for this position that I hold. As long as I, you know, hold this position, I get to enjoy these um, what are they, perks. I get to enjoy the perks that come with the position. As long as I humble myself and understand that I don't deserve it, you know? Now what if, <clears throat> here's, here's um, an example of arrogance. Arrogance is if he demanded a ceramic cup. What if, <clears throat> what if he asked the aide, you know, can I have a cup of coffee? And the aide says, oh yeah, you know, right there, you can pour yourself a cup of coffee. And he says, do you, have, do you know who I am? How dare you? Do you have any idea who you're talking to? I'm the former secretary, undersecretary of defense. You, I demand you get me a cup of coffee and bring in a ceramic cup, you know? Are you serious? I will have your job, you know? What if you behave that way? And... Mm -hmm you know, just made a big fit because he felt like he deserved the styrofoam cup, right? Because of who he was inherently, you know? If he behaved that way, yeah, maybe the aide would have ran and got him a styrofoam, or ceramic cup of coffee, maybe. You know, just to get him to shut up. You know what I'm saying? Don't we do that sometimes? You know, here you go, just, just get out of my face. You know, and stop bothering me, I have things to do, right? So maybe the aide would have ran and got him a cup of coffee and a ceramic cup just to shut him up, but would he have respected him? Would it, you know, what would he have thought of him inside? It's kind of like when the emperor walks by, you bow lowly and fart silently. <laughs> you know, you, you, you let out a little silent fart as you bow as he walks by. You know, it's kind of like that, that passive aggressive, you know? People don't really respect that kind of behavior if you demand it, you know? You don't get respect by demand. You get respect by earning it, by giving respect, right? By showing respect. And so I think we, 
you know, because they say if pride goes before a fall, I don't think pride goes before a fall. I think arrogance goes before a fall. To think that you're better than, to think that you deserve more than. You know, we, none of us deserve anything more than anyone else. We are all the same and we all deserve the styrofoam cup. But as we work on our craft and as we become more senior in our industries, in whatever career your field is, as you rise, it's inevitable, you will start to gain favor. And it's okay to enjoy those favors as long as it doesn't get to your head and you don't forget that this is just for the position that you're holding right now in your life. You know, it's not because you're better than anyone else. And that goes the same for others too. Others who may be enjoying perks and things in their lives that you may feel maybe envious about, just realize this is just a, a stage in their lives, you know, because of the position that they hold. And who knows the future? Anything can happen that might, you know, get them to lose that position. And then now their life is gonna be a little more tough. And I always ask people, if someone that you're jealous of, that you think has much more than you, and, you're, and that upsets you for some reason, what if they lost it all? Would that make you happy? You know, if they lost it all in some, you know, big business failure or something, you know, something happened in the market or something and it caused them to lose everything, will any of that money somehow fall into your pocket or your bank account? No, you know, I feel like it, you know, true pride in oneself, I think is the best way because when you're feeling good about yourself and you're working towards goals that are meaningful to, to, to you and you're making measurable progress towards those meaningful goals that you've made for yourself and when you feel proud of yourself and you feel good about yourself, it makes it really hard to feel negative towards others. You know, I think having your own unique goals to work on is the best way to avoid feeling envious or jealous or any of those negative feelings and you actually feel happy when others do well <clears throat> you know it's the law of integrity so the law of integrity is a traditional chinese medicine law which says that all the internal organs of the body are connected through energy lines called meridians so which means the you know the spleen the appendix all of these the lungs all of these different organs of the body have energy lines that run all through and connects everything. Um, for example, when the liver is not functioning well, the eyes turn yellow, you know, the jaundice, <clears throat> even emotions, when you get angry, super angry, your eyes turn red, right? So um, they say that everything's connected. So it would be in the lungs best interest that the heart does well, it would be in the liver's best interest that the spleen does well, right? But none of these body organs, none of these organs stop what they're doing to check and make sure the other organ is doing what they're supposed to. They just do their best and they trust that the others are doing their best as well, right? And here's the thing, um, they, they zoom out and they say the law of integrity also applies you know, on a macro scale, not just a micro. So if you zoom out, all species on the planet, you know, all humans are somehow connected. We all affect each other. This coronavirus is probably a great example of how we all affect each other. We're all connected. And then he, he, uh, the law of integrity says that the, all the species and all life forms on earth are interconnected. You know, everything affects another. The way one for the health of a forest affects the health of the world. So everything is connected. And then they can even zoom out and say that um, all the planets are connected. You know, the earth, the moon, all the planets in our solar system. It's all, um, you know, ro revolve, evolving, rotating around each other, right? 
So that's the thing is if we understand the law of integrity and it does make sense, then we understand that it's actually in our best interest that others do well. You know, it's almost enlightened. No, not almost. It is. It's the enlightened person that can truth, like truly feel joy for the success of another because they understand that that person's success is also your success. When that person does well, we all do well. So, oh my goodness. <clears throat> Man, I don't know how I got into that. But I told you guys, you know, it's gonna get deep in here. <laughs> okay. So now even the front legs, you can tell the difference between this leg that's been combed and that leg that has not. See the difference? This one almost looks dreaded, like dreadlocks, right? This one's all come down now. Okay. Wow. Wow, look at this. So it doesn't look like much while we're combing it out, but look at this. Little by little, little becomes a lot. Okay. Any questions? Oh, Tara. Hey June, I hope you're doing well. I've missed seeing your live shows. I've been going through a tough time, but I'm motivated by things you have to share to get through it. Thank you. Such oh, thank you, Tara. You know, <coughs> Tara, if you're still watching this, Tara, I wonder if you're familiar with the phrase, life is like a roller coaster. Have you heard that? Life is like a roller coaster? Because it's truer than you think, you know, it's actually a very true statement. And I shared this quote earlier, but you, you know, it was, it was when I started this live stream. But Helen Keller says, life is a great adventure or nothing at all. Just like a roller coaster, right? That's why we go to the, to the theme park, to Six Flags. It's for the adventure, right? To get scared, to ride the rides. Life, I believe, is scary. It's terrifying sometimes. And you sometimes you feel like you're gonna die. That's why life is like a roller coaster. You know, my younger daughter Annabelle, um, when we got she's finally tall enough to ride the big roller coasters. When we got off, I was so scared for her. I was like, what a horrible father, what did I do? You know, because it was scary. And when I asked her, Annabelle, were you scared? She goes, Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, are you okay? And she goes, yeah, that's why we ride the rides, right? To get scared. I was like, ah, that's why we ride the rides, to get scared, brilliant, you know? And that's, I think, the same answer for life. Why is life so hard? Why is life so scary sometimes? And it feels like we're gonna die. That's why we're here, you know? You know, so I was, I was having a conversation with my daughter yesterday no yeah yesterday and no it was two days ago and recently i'll just say that recently i had a conversation with my daughter and i realized how much i don't know just by trying to answer her questions honestly and i realized i don't actually know for sure where we come from you know i don't know why we're here for sure I don't really know what the objective is, you know? Like when you, when you start a video game or something, there's usually an objective, like a point, you know? There's no point, don't, I don't know if there's a point to all this. And then I don't know where we go after, we're, after this is done. I don't know what happens, you know? And to be honest, I realized, wow, I know so little. <laughs> and then I realized, I don't, think anyone, I don't think any one of us knows for sure, you know? So then maybe life, maybe life is just what we make of it, what we decide to make of it, right? Um, and I, I love this quote by um, Nemo Patel. He has an album called Empty Hands, um, super uplifting music. But um, he said in an interview, we all come into this world empty handed and we all leave this world empty handed. So the only question we really have to ask ourselves is, how do I want to spend my time here, right? Because let's just say that planet Earth 
is like a theme park, you know, like Six Flags or Disney World, you know. <clears throat> and we're here to ride the rides. We're here to get scared. We're <laughs> scared to death, you know. We're here to scream our heads off, you know. <laughs> Ah, I'm gonna die, you know? Let's say that's why we're here, to experience that, to experience the thrill of living, right? Then the price of admission to come into this park called Planet Earth, the price of admission is being born, right? Our mothers paid our price of admission. It was probably a very high price to pay. It was painful. They had to go through a lot. Carry us for nine months, you know? So we all have our mothers to thank for paying the price of admission for us being here on planet Earth, the greatest theme park in the galaxy, right? Now, what's included with the price of admission, just like any theme park, is all the rides. You get to ride whatever ride you want. I would recommend the friendship ride, you know? <sighs> it's fun. Sometimes the friendship ride is followed up by the fallout ride, and that's, it has, it's a sudden scary job. <laughs> I would recommend the falling in love ride. Oh, it's nice. You know, I wouldn't recommend a divorce ride. It's a little rough. And I thought I was gonna die, <laughs> you know? But I would recommend that you get in line and ride the rides while you're here, right? And here's the thing, just like on at Six Flags, you can't ride all the rides you want because your time is limited, right? That's why it's so important to decide how we wanna spend our time here. Our time is limited. So we don't have time to stand in all the lines and ride all the rides. So you have to pick and choose. You have to prioritize. Which ride is most important to you? Is it your friendships ride? Is it the family ride? You know, what ride is most important to you? Get in line and ride that one first. You know, and then if you have time, then try the other rides, you know? Getting drunk ride, you know? It's a fun one. You lose control. <laughs> but. What I wouldn't suggest is going after the prizes. You know how at Six Flags or other theme parks you can pay extra money and play the games and you win the prizes, you take the teddy bears home or the basketball, whatever it is. The way this theme park, the way Planet Earth is set up, you, get, you can't take any of the prizes home with you. You can pay extra here on Earth, use extra resources and get nice things and you can have lots of prizes. The only thing is you can't take it home with you when you leave planet Earth. But the way that this theme park is set up, you have to leave all the prizes behind. You can't take any of the prize possessions, but what you do get to take with you are the experiences. You get to take the memories, the stories that you get to tell. You know, did you try the getting fired ride, losing your job out of nowhere ride? I liked it so much, I ride it three times. I got back in line, right back in line. You know, did you try, did you try the broke ride? You can't pay your bills. Wasn't that a crazy ride, you know? So once your time here on earth is done, you know, I think it's about getting together and saying, wasn't that fun? You know, wasn't that crazy? You know, weren't you scared? Yeah, scared. That's why we went to planet Earth, right? To get scared, <laughs> in the words of my young daughter. So, um, was it Tara? Tara, if you're still watching this, I'd like to welcome you to planet Earth, the greatest theme park in the entire galaxy. I hope you enjoy your stay. Our kids are so smart. I think your point is to love people. I think our point is to love people. Mm, I agree. Yes, we give back. We, well, yes, what we give back to the world is key. I love looking at, at it that way. What an adventure, exactly. And don't worry about looking bad or making mistakes or making a wrong decision. You know, <clears throat> like Mike Posner says, there's no right or wrong way to do a day. The only wrong way to do a day is to believe there's a right way to do it. Let that sink in. Just like if you were at Six Flags, you know, Who's to tell you how to plan your day at Six Flags? That's for you to choose. There's no right or wrong way to live our lives. The only wrong way to live your life is to believe that there was a right way to do it. <coughs> you know, if life is like a jungle and we're all just trying to find our way through it, 
then like the Buddha says, when you're going through the jungle of life, it would be foolish to turn to your neighbor and say you're going the wrong way. You don't know. <laughs> you know, we're all just finding our way. Tara says, thank you. That is very freeing. Awesome, Tara. There are no accidents in this universe, I believe. I don't think it was a coincidence that you joined this stream. But I really appreciate that, Tara. It makes me feel like I'm not just rambling. <laughs> You know, I really like J.K. Rowling's quote. She says, it's impossible to live your life without failing at something unless you live so carefully that you might as well not have lived at all, in which case you fail by default. I love that, you know? Like, I think, especially in myself, I struggle with um, not wanting to look bad, you know, wanting to avoid looking, you know, being embarrassed. You know, but now I realize it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, it's okay to look bad. It's okay to fail at things or make mistakes, you know? That's what life's about. Life is not meant to live, be lived error-free. How can you learn from your mistakes if you never make any, right? Better to live 30 years full of adventure than 100 years safe in the corner, right? What kind of life is that? So, for me, I just feel like, you know, there's, our life really is just what we decide to make of it, right? It's for us to choose. And of course you can't change your life overnight. But out of all the life forms on earth, human beings are special because we have the ability to project into the future and imagine what our life, life might look like in two, three years from now, you know? And we can say to ourselves, if nothing changes and things continue the way they're going for the next two, three years, what would things look like? And we have the ability to imagine that. And if we don't like what that looks like, we can say, okay, instead of going there, what if I could change my destination? What if I could choose a different de destination? And in two, three years, I would like my life to look like this. You know, then we can start to plan, make, make a plan, start, start taking steps to achieve that goal. You know, we can change the set of the sale, you know, and change the destination, work towards that. You know, human beings have that ability, you know. Jim Rohn says, if you don't like where you are, move, you're not a tree. <laughs> But it takes time. I think that's the key, is that things take time. That's why I love grooming, because it reminds me that there is no trick to this. There is no shortcut. There is no magic wand, you know? I just have to be willing to take the time and sweat, you know? Put in the time and the effort to go through and, you know, comb the dog out. This is honest work. And that's why I love it. Cause see how it's catching here? But I combed this leg out, look at that. You know, like butter. So nobody can go through and say, I didn't do that. You know, that's why I love grooming because I feel like I'm doing real work that matters, that makes a difference. All right. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> so the other day I was working at one of my clients house and she had some contractors over and I asked them um, They had painted her wall recently Tara says wow. Oh me too, but sometimes we can try to laugh ourselves and laugh at ourselves and point out our silly quirks When we don't take ourselves too seriously, it helps others not to be too critical either. Yeah, exactly but I think that, to your point, Tara, I think that when we have that kind of attitude where we just 
tell ourselves that we're not going to take offense to things. And even if somebody does point out, like, let's say we, we make a mistake and we look bad, right? We mess up and we're publicly shamed, right? And people say things like, oh, you know, you could have done this or you should have done this or, you know, if we take the approach of I'm going to accept all this feedback and use it to get better, then, you know, you're unoffendable. So even if someone says, hey, dummy, you shouldn't have done that and, you know, acted so stupid, you can say, oh, I'm glad you pointed that out. That was pretty stupid behavior, wasn't it? I'm going to you know, consider that and make some changes, you know, that person can't, you know, unless, I mean, I'm sure they could, if they're a bully, they can continue, but most people will be like, hmm, you know, <laughs> it might even make them feel bad, like, hey, sorry, man, I didn't mean to go into you that hard, you know, <laughs> I didn't think you were going to be so reasonable, you know, because most people aren't, even if you have good intentions, you know, if you tell somebody who's acting like a jerk, you know, like, hey, the way you're behaving, you know, you're, you're acting like a jerk. Most people aren't going to say, oh my goodness, thank you so much for waking me up. I don't know what, what got into me. You just stepped me out of it. Thank you so much. I'm not going to act like a jerk anymore. You know, N not a lot of people <laughs> are going to be self-aware enough, you know, to react that way. If you tell somebody who's acting like a jerk, hey, you're really acting like a jerk right now. Most people will say, so are you, you know, or what do you, you know, like they'll get defensive. You know, very few people, they say the fastest way to offend somebody is to tell them they're wrong. So yeah, very few people um, have the ability, and myself included, it's, you know, I'm still working on this. I know it, but I'm still working on it. You know, it's like a knee-jerk reaction when somebody says something that feels mean or unfair. You know, your knee-jerk reaction is to get defensive and maybe go on the offensive yourself, you know, attack them. But I've learned that it, it's much better to be kind than to be right. And I learned that from Dr. Wayne Dyer. Dr. Wayne Dyer says, whenever we have a cho choice to be kind or to be right, it's better to be kind. And in my experience, from my own mistakes, I've learned that he's right. <laughs> whenever you have a choice to be kind or to be right, it's better to be kind. And we always have a choice. Okay, it may not feel like it's a choice all the time. Alrighty, so. Oh. Alright, I'm gonna drink of water. Ah. Ooh -wee. So now I just have this one leg, one last rear leg to do. And then, combing through this body, this next section is going to be pretty easy. And then, this combing out his head, also going to be pretty easy. So, usually the head and the body torso area here, it's going to be pretty easy to get brushed out. So that's why, you know, I don't really focus on that at first, because you know, I don't want to spend all my time and energy doing the easy part first and then start doing the hard stuff. I want to do the hard stuff first and then, you know, as I'm getting more, my energy levels are, you know, draining a little bit like a video game. You see the energy bar going down, then I can do the easy stuff, right? Oh, you know, that's Brian Tracy. Brian Tracy says, always do what's difficult and necessary before doing what's fun and easy. Always do what's difficult and necessary before you do what's fun and easy. I like that because he's not saying don't do what's fun and easy, because I would not be a fan of that. <laughs> you know, if he said don't ever do what's fun and easy, I'd say I'm out, I don't like this philosophy. But he says always do what's difficult and necessary before you do what's fun and easy. And I can, I can buy into that. You know, that's something I can subscribe to. And he says that most people who are unsuccessful, you'll find that they live their life the opposite. They do what's fun and easy first, and then they try to squeeze in the difficult, necessary stuff, you know, cramming in at the end of the day. 
And that's why they always have more to do the next day, right? So he's saying that, oh, Les Brown says, if you do what is easy, your life will be hard. If you do what is hard, your life will be easy. And I like that. So, you know, oh, so Jim Rohn says it this way. We all have to pay the price of two... No, we all have to pay... Oh, we all have to suffer one of two pains is what it is. Okay, so here's the quote from Jim Rohn. We all must suffer one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Discipline weighs ounces. Regret weighs tons. Boom. Hashtag mic drop. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We all must suffer one of two pains. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Discipline weighs ounces. Regret weighs tons. Isn't that powerful? But here's the thing. Again, I'm not using all of these quotes to justify <laughs> all this like, you know, sweating and hard work that I'm doing and everything saying like, oh, you should do, no. What I'm saying is that, you know, this is just my style. This is what I'm doing. And again, like I explained before, I don't think that this is practical in a grooming shop environment, a groom salon, because they only have an hour or two at the most to get the dog done. That means start to finish, hour or two per dog. I've been streaming an hour and 22 minutes now, <laughs> and I'm now working on the last leg, <laughs> you know? So obviously, this is not a practical way to groom dogs in a, in a salon setting, dog grooming shop setting, because they have a lot of other dogs that day, the price point, the overhead they have to meet, it just, the business model does not, um, does not support this kind of grooming procedure, regrooming process. The way I'm able to get away with it is because I no longer have a shop overhead. <laughs> I no longer have like a minimum amount I have to make per day to break even. You know, I just have to buy some grooming supplies, stock it up. I'm using my client's space. I'm using their electricity, their water. <laughs> I, I'm just bringing in my tools and my skills, you know. So that's why I'm able to do it because I don't have to charge as much. I can schedule it this way, you know, but it's finding your own way. It's doing what you believe is right for you and doing what is enjoyable for you. This would not be enjoyable for a lot of people. Many people have made it clear to me, like, dude, June, you can have all that brushing, you know? <laughs> they tell me clearly, they're like, you can have all that brushing. Like, that's not for me. And I get it. And I just happen to like it. You know, this is, this is what I like to do. I, I gotta spend my day doing something. Might as well spend it, you know, loving on a dog and making them feel comfortable, right? Giving them a nice haircut. Um, okay, here's a great quote. I don't know who said it, so you'll have to look it up. But here's the quote. There are two types of people that won't get along in this world, that never get ahead, right? There's two types of people, and I know, I don't like those types of quotes either. There's two types of people. But this one makes sense. There are two types of people in this world that never get ahead. Those that cannot do what they're told, and those who cannot do anything else. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? Those who cannot do what they're told, right? We've all worked with people like that. You, you ask them to do something, they just can't do it for some reason, you know, incompetent, <laughs> you know, or they just don't care or whatever, right? So there are those type of people, those who cannot do what they're told. But then the other type that never really gets ahead it, are the type that cannot do anything else that can only do what they're told, and they can't think of anything else. They're not self-starters. They're not creative, you know? Or maybe they are, but they just don't have the courage to say anything or do things differently, you know? But yeah, it's like, you wanna be like Bruce Lee, right? Bruce Lee says, take what works, discard what doesn't, and create your own style, right? So you wanna learn from everyone. Watch as many different groomers as you can. 
learn from as many as you can, right? And then take what you like, take what resonates with you, what, what clicks with you and makes you feel like, yes, you know, that's, that's what I agree with, you know, that's what I like. And then develop your own unique style, right? Be you. You know, I told my daughters this before as well, but I believe that every single one of us, we are all a piece of the puzzle. I believe that we all, as, as the human race, make together, make up a big, grand, beautiful picture. We are all part of the great picture, right? But we all are shaped differently, right? If you look at a puzzle, puzzle all the pieces are shaped differently. <clears throat> they have to be. If all the pieces were shaped the same, the puzzle wouldn't work. Or it would be an extremely easy puzzle, you know, if they're all square pieces. <laughs> you know, what is this, preschool, you know? But most puzzles, you know, if you look at like the 500, 1,000 piece puzzles, all the shapes are different, the jigsaws, right? Some of the shapes look warped. They look ugly. They look, you know, like maybe this shape was mis miscut or something, right? You get some really weird, oddly shaped pieces in there. Some that look like they don't belong. But if we discard those pieces, you know, because just because they look unsightly, then the, pu the, piece, the puzzle wouldn't work. We would be missing that piece of the puzzle, right? <clears throat> and I asked my daughters one time, um, what would happen if all the corner pieces and all the side pieces, you know, the outer edge pieces, what if all the corner pieces got together and decided that all the other puzzle pieces needed a flat side too, right? So they gave all the pieces one flat edge. What would happen? And she goes, the puzzle wouldn't work. <laughs> I was like, exactly right. The puzzle wouldn't work. And that's what happens when we try to be like another piece, another piece of the puzzle, or other pieces of the puzzle try to get us to look like them or be more like them then the puzzle doesn't work. The picture isn't gonna be clear. You know, and none of us has the big picture. We're all just those tiny piece of the big picture, right? So we all have to come together to see what the big picture is, right? And I think that this coronavirus happening worldwide, I think it's a, it's, it's a wake up call. I think it's a good reminder that we are all on this, in this together. You know, there's only one race that matters. It's the human race. We're all a part of this planet, this one rock called planet Earth, right? And I think by, by forcing us to deal with this global threat that's threatening all of us, it's kind of causing the world to come together to try to work together to try to stop this thing because it's affecting all of us, not just one country anymore. You know, and I think that this is a good reminder, just like Ronald Reagan said, it would be unfortunate, but it, maybe it would take an alien invasion, you know, a threat from the outside our planet to make our planet wake up and realize that we're all on the same team, that we're all on this planet, this rock, this giant round spaceship spinning in space. We're all on this planet together. You know, one world, one race, the human race. And I think that, you know, it is very unfortunate what's happening and it's scary. You know, it, it, I'm scared, just to be honest with you, about the whole coronavirus thing. It's scary, you know, but it's also helping us realize that, you know, we've always been connected. We just didn't realize how connected we were, you know, and now we need to come together and try to, you know, work on this together without panic, you know, because when we're, when we're scared and we're panicked and fearful, um, it's hard to think clearly and make good decisions. So we have to just, you know, I, I believe, I, this is just my opinion from a dog groomer, <laughs> take it for what it is, but I think that we just need to be calm about this, assess the situation, really just take an objective look, take an inventory of what's going on, 
and just constantly, you know, just, um, I think, you know, the, especially the world, the different nations coming together and sharing information, China being open about all of the information that they found, working together to try to find a vaccination, a cure for this, um, you know, I think, I think it's, uh, it's unfortunate what's happening, but it is nice to see the world coming together and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what to do about this. The weird thing is, I heard um, some interviews in China. Um, there are some gym owners who have been struggling to, you know, make, it, make an income and make any money because all the gyms are closed. They're banned from going to any kind of gyms, work because sweat, working out, and things like that. So gym owners are now, because they've been closed for, what, over six weeks, and they're saying that at least for another four weeks, they're going to have to stay closed. So that's no business for them for like 10 weeks straight. And um, so what they've been doing is making private house calls, um, doing one-on-one -on -one, you know, fitness instruction and one-on-one -on -one appointments. And I was like thinking to myself, whoa, wow. It's like I've already been planning on this, you know? <laughs> that's what I do. But uh, not to make light of the situation, but yeah, it's, it's affecting everyone. One thing that kind of does worry me is like, yeah, if we're all quarantined and we're not allowed to leave our houses for two weeks or more, then what about people who kind of, you know, live paycheck to paycheck and we kind of need that steady income to continue paying our bills? What happens to that, you know? So I don't know. There's a... I listened to Joe Rogan's podcast yesterday uh, with that gentleman who's working on it right now, with that team. <sighs> All right, let me pick up some of this. Yeah, isn't this amazing? So this is all his winter coat, his winter underwear. Last season's coat. So now that we've gone through it, with this, broke it up, then broke up the more of the mats with this. Now I can go through with the metal comb, which again, I stated at the beginning of this, this stream, an hour and a half ago when I started, <laughs> that the goal of the prep was to get this comb to be able to go through the code. Look at that. Let's try the fine tooth side. Nice. So now that I can get this comb, to go through his code, there we go. Let's pull those mats up. Now I know I can wash him and his skin. Oh, excuse me, hold on one second. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> I don't have the I'm, I don't have the COVID nineteen thing is um, because my nose does get a little runny sometimes because I'm breathing in the stander you know dead hair and everything um, I, I because I tend to worry you know so I was like oh my god do I have coronavirus you know I don't want to spread it to anyone you know I don't want to be quarantined and um, runny nose is not one of the symptoms I was like yes <laughs> I don't have COVID nineteen but yeah oh man. But here's a, I guess, an ethical question for me. If I do get a cough and a headache and fever, and I do feel like maybe I have the coronavirus, do I cancel all my appointments for the next two weeks and just stay home? You know, because then, you know, what will that do to my, my financial situation, my income and my bills and you know, I'm on a budget and I plan things, you know, a month or two ahead. So if I can't leave the house for two weeks because I don't want to spread the virus to anybody, even though I know that I might get over it, I don't want to possibly give it to one of my clients who may not be able to get over it. So even though it would be a huge hit to my, to my income, to me financially, I would take a huge hit financially 
the right thing to do would be to stay home, right? And to cancel my appointments and explain to them we just have to reschedule until the symptoms go away, you know, until I'm clear, all right? And not that I am gonna get it, but, you know, I, I, the thought did cross my mind though, you know, if, you know, cause I mean, I guess anything's possible, right? Because it is here in Georgia now. And actually one of the cases is in Gwinnett County in Lawrenceville where I live. So, um, you know, if, if in the event that I do get the coronavirus, I ask myself, would I continue making house calls? Would I continue my business? You know, because I'm kind of, I kind of count on that money to pay my bills. But then that answer, because my answer is like, okay, what if I said yes? What if I do just go and do my appointments and groom the dogs? Why would I be doing it? Well, the honest answer would be, I'm doing it because I'm scared that I won't have enough money to pay my bills and I'm scared to go broke again. You know, I know what that was like to get my car repossessed, not be able to pay my bills, you know, have collectors hounding you. I know what that's like and I don't want that to ever happen again. So I guess it would be fear that would motivate that decision. <clears throat> if that's the case, and I'm being honest with myself, then I would probably want to just reschedule everyone, you know, cancel the appointments and reschedule because I don't want to allow fear to motivate my decisions anymore, you know, so I want to just, uh, you know, try to live life fearlessly, um, fear less, right? Not fearless to me doesn't mean no fear. It means to fear less. <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to do is fear less. What would you do? Anybody's watching. If you felt like you have the coronavirus and they're asking you to voluntarily quarantine yourself for two weeks and you have bills to pay, children to take care of, you know, what would you do? Would you continue to just go to work and try to hide the symptoms and possibly get other people sick? Or would you voluntarily quarantine yourself for two weeks? I don't know. I, it would be a very tough decision. I wouldn't make it lightly, but I think I would quarantine myself and just reschedule everyone. Tara says, yes, you would have to cancel your appointments in that case, unfortunately. I have an immune disorder that, God forbid, if someone did value their finances over health. It, oh, exactly. That's exactly right. <clears throat> and that's what would kill me, is if I felt like I made the decision to go and keep the appointment um, with the possibility that I was sick just because it was a financial decision and that person possibly dies. I don't know, I, I think that would kill me inside. I don't know if I could live with that. So that's why, yeah, if I felt like I had the coronavirus, if even there was like slight possibility, if I felt like I had a fever or headache, cough, you know, and that's the crazy thing is um, people who watch my channel, they know I cough, you know? <laughs> I've been coughing for the past three years and I have this, uh... anyway, um, now I feel kind of scared. Like, oh, I should, maybe I shouldn't cough, you know? People are gonna look at me like I have the coronavirus. Um, I have, I have had to stay home before and take cut and pay because I was sick and didn't want to get the kids working with it. Yeah, yeah, it's really about the safety of others, you know? And I think when we make a decision based on fear, you know, scared that I am not gonna be able to, you know, have enough money to pay the bills and I'm gonna starve to death and I'm gonna die, you know? <laughs> It's like fear kind of causes us to think irrationally, you know, buy up all the toilet paper in the stores, right? Like, it makes, it makes people behave irrationally, fear, you know? So, one of my friends actually, um, they, have a, they had a birthday party planned for their, for their baby. Um, their baby's turning one. Or was it two? <laughs> Sorry. 
But anyways, um, it was this. It was tomorrow, and I had the day off planned, you know, so we can go to celebrate their birthday party, and they canceled it because of the coronavirus. And I have a lot of respect for that, you know, because all that planning, probably deposits that they had to make on everything that's probably non-refundable, you know, they probably spent a lot of money that they that they were thinking of everyone else's health. You know, what if somebody got the coronavirus at that event? Then all of us would have to get tested, you know, the older people that were there. So I really think that that was, you know, forward thinking of them. And even though it was probably a very tough decision and probably a huge inconvenience on them, you know, because, you know, catering, um, you know, putting a deposit on the venue, all of that stuff, I mean, probably cost them a lot of money that they couldn't get refunded, but they made the decision to cancel anyways in the interest of public health, public safety, the safety of others, you know? I really respect that. <coughs> um, Terrence says, because I was sick and didn't want to get the kids. Uh, Terrence says, don't worry about your cough. You have had that so long for so many videos. <laughs> I think we can look back and see it's not COVID-19. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh man. Okay, so now we gotta brush out his head. And he's all brushed out. Oh man. And then I'm gonna let him down and take a little, give him a little break. Oh man. So. Thank you guys so much for joining. Man, hopefully this was helpful to somebody. I know I talk a lot. I don't know. I just have. <laughs> you ever see Crudes? You know, um, what's his name? Grug. <laughs> I have these ideas, you know. Anyways, um, thank you guys for watching this. I hope this was helpful. If you have a doodle, see. So now, I still have to comb out his torso area, but you see how this area, the body is usually much easier to comb through. So this is going to be a breeze. His head is gonna be much easier, see that? Even though it is tangled up and kind of matted down at the skin level, the head, the ears, and the body are usually pretty easy. See, so then, got them all brushed out, and then I like to give him a little break before we give him a bath. Oh, okay, such a relaxed puppy. Have a great day. Yeah, right, see? Look at all. Oh. Cause I really think that he feels better. I mean, look at this, with all of this, you know, that we brushed out. Look at all this. Ugh. See, I mean, he's got to feel better, right? With all of that out of his skin now. And now he feels so much more softer. Look at his legs. Right? He's got to feel much better. So, just wanted to show you that's the work and the time that goes in in the prep. Um, my step two of the process. Step one is build rapport, of course. You want to at least, especially if it's your first time meeting the dog, you want to get them at least comfortable with you, you know, gain permission to touch them. And then once they're cool with you, oh, look at them. And they, they enjoy having you comb them and it's relaxing for them, you know, because we trust each other. We know each other, you know, there's rapport here. So that's step one, build rapport. Step two would be to prep the skin, which is what we did. See that? Prep the skin. So it looks nice and soft. And that way we can give them a nice bath. So that's step two. Now I'm about to do step three. People have asked me to show step three, the bath. And they have, I saw the comments and some of the videos like, you know, how come you never show the step three? Well, because step three is in here, <laughs> right? We take a shower in there together. And um, I like to take my clothes off. Just to be honest with you, you know, I like to take my clothes off and I get in there with them and, you know, so step three, <laughs> I would like to show step three and show you the whole wash and dry process, but, you know, I mean, <laughs> unless you have red tube, <laughs> I'm kidding, um, but yeah, it, it can get a little bit, um, a little bit risque, you know what I'm saying? So, maybe, yeah, because I don't like to get my underwear wet, 
you know, like, so I take my underwear off and stuff. I don't like to get my underwear wet because then once my underwear gets wet, I'm going to have to grow, you know, so. <laughs> but what I'll, maybe what I'll do is um, I'll show the drying. No, because the drying process gets really loud. It's boring. I'll, I'll stream that when I do the haircut. How about that? When I do the haircut, I'll stream that. See you guys.